Well, good morning and welcome to South Mountain Community Church. Will you guys stand with us as we sing? I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb. Till I met Continue to sing. Find me, 
pray with me. God, we're thankful um, that your house um, and, and your presence is a place where we can come and be free of shame and free of um, bondage. So this morning, would you remind us of that as we sing and as we hear your word? In your name we pray. Amen. Go ahead and take a seat. Hi, SMCC. Welcome to South Mountain Community Church. My name is Rachel, and I've called the South Jordan campus my home for eight years. Man, time flies. <laughs> it's crazy. So anyway, if this is your first time here, I want to thank you for deciding to join us in, on your Sunday. And um, I want to encourage you to do something. We have something called Connect Cards. Uh, in the seat back of the seat in front of you is a card that you can fill out. And once you do that, uh, you can put it in one of the black boxes at the back or put it at the green table uh, out in the lobby and chat with somebody. But basically what's going to happen is a pastor is going to reach out and they're not going to spam you. They're not going to call you incessantly and be like, why didn't you come last Sunday? No, they're going to maybe take you out for coffee and uh, get to know you a little better, but it'll be on your terms. So uh, definitely encourage you to do that to learn a little more about the church. So a few things that are coming up real soon. We have SMCCU, which are in-depth 
uh, theological, biblical studies. They're about eight week courses. We have two here at this campus. One's called the Book of Acts. And the Book of Acts is exactly what it sounds like. It's about a very important book in the Bible and the New Testament that goes very deep into those early years of the church. And we also have one called Following Jesus. So Following Jesus is about following Jesus, but <laughs> pull one of Trevor's moves there. It's about <laughs> following Jesus, uh, but it's about his spiritual uh, teachings and the things or spiritual uh, practices that Jesus engaged in that he taught and that he left for us to use. So both of those are in-depth courses, really, if you nerd out on that kind of thing, or if you just want to learn more about the Bible, both are really great options. And um, those start on the 23rd of this month, on Monday the 23rd, so sign up soon. And I also want to talk about community groups. So community groups are a huge part of what makes any church family work. They are small groups of people that you get together with and you do life with. So we don't always have an opportunity to have community, but it is always something that we need. So here at SMCC, you have that opportunity. And I just, a huge plug for it. It's been my family. For the eight years that I've been at this church, my various small groups I've been a part of, they supported me when I had my babies. They brought me meals. They helped me with job things, like when I needed to get advice or uh, resume building or various things. I can't say enough for my small group and the role that they've played in my life. So definitely consider signing up for one of those. There's a few going on right now, and there's new ones starting in a couple weeks. So, and for as far as community is concerned, one more thing, the men's breakfast, the next, the first one of the season's coming up. And I hear there's going to be lots of bacon, like excessive amounts of it. So if you're a guy, please consider signing up. And uh, Jay will have these in the lobby. This kind of got crinkled in my pocket, but these great little cards. They have the QR codes in the back that you can scan with your smartphone uh, to go ahead and register for that. And that's next Saturday. So go ahead and do that. So if you have been in and out of the church for the last few weeks or a few months, or even if this is your first day and you know you want to get connected, all of those are really great options for being a part of a community here in South Jordan and the surrounding areas. So we're going to continue in worship and uh, sing to the Lord. Go ahead and stand as we sing. Alone in my sorrow. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin. Lost without hope with no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested and my life began. Ash was redeemed. Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains. And my orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested, and my life began. Oh, your grace. Oh, your grace. So free. Washes over me. You have made me new now. Life begins with you. It's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new. Release from my chains. Release from my chains. I'm a prisoner no more. My pain was a ransom faithfully born. And he canceled my debt and he called me his friend. When death was arrested, my life began. Oh, your grace. over me you have made me new now life begins with you it's your endless love oh, it's your endless 
Savior displayed on a criminal's cross And darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost But then Jesus arose with the freedom in hell Would you pray with me? God, this morning we praise you and we thank you for, for your mighty uh, power and your works over human history. To be the only one who could defeat death, the only one who's capable of overcoming the spiritual evils in our world. And God, this morning, uh, would you just remind us of your power and your glory, um, that there's nothing else worth, worth living for, there's no one else who can overcome the darkness in our world but you. In your name we pray, amen. Go ahead and take a seat. Well, for those of you I haven't met, my name's Trevor. I serve as one of the pastors here at SMCC. Just want to say thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. And uh, I just got to say, 12 o'clock service, shout out to y'all. You're the ones who know that Jesus matters more than football. So thank you for being here. <laughs> and, and I hope you've got your game recorded at the same time. So <laughs> um, yeah, so if I could just share a little bit of um, history from my own life that maybe connects to some season in your own as well. The year was 1997, and even though we were just a few years away from Y2K, something would occur within this year that would forever change the world and life as we know it, because this was the year in which the Nintendo 64 video game was released, GoldenEye 007, and it drastically changed the face of the world forever, right? Proximity mines, paintball mode, the golden gun, it, it, was, it was real. And, uh, <laughs> and if there's one thing that, that I learned from this game, right, leaning in on it, uh, it would be something about battle in general, and, and it would just be this, about battle strategy in general, that this is the lesson learned, um, that in battle... Uh, battle, every battle requires you to know your enemy, understand their methods, choose your weapons, establish offensive and defensive lines, and if necessary, to mount a counterattack. And this was true of Goldeneye in the 90s. It's true, likely, of Fortnite today. And I know it's true of every modern warfare, Call of Duty uh, rendition along the way in between, right? But the point of bringing it up today is not just to equip us to better engage within our, our you know, combat video games, but instead instead to equip us for an actual real battle that every single one of us finds ourselves in the midst of whether we recognize it or not which is the battle against spiritual evil 
Today at SMCC, we're continuing our series called The Unseen Battle, which is all about delving into the subject of spiritual warfare, something that uh, we're covering over the course of four weeks. We actually opened up the series last week and kind of laid the, found, uh, the, the, the foundation, the groundwork, and set the stage for this conversation and for this series. And so last week, what we really looked at was just sort of um, establishing what the biblical worldview is. What is the picture of reality, the story of reality that the biblical writings present to us? us? And then how does that make sense of evil and even equip us to be able to respond to it within our lives? And so really in a significant way, last week was really setting the stage in the most macro level for this conversation, for this subject. But today the aim is to zoom much further in and to take some really practical next steps today as we delve into this subject. And there's really two questions that we're looking to answer together this afternoon. The first is this, how do we recognize when spiritual evil is actually present within our lives? How do we recognize the demonic when it's at play within our lives? And then the second question is a follow-up from that. What do we do when we find out that is the case? And so over the next 25 or so minutes, those are really the two questions that I want to unpack together as we continue this series, The Unseen Battle. And really the first thing I want to just um, kind of throw out in the conversation comes from a passage that's written by Peter, uh, one of the disciples of Jesus, significant leader in the early church. And he himself is writing on this particular topic. And this is what he says, 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. He says, be alert and of sober mind. Question is why? It says, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Now, I have never been on safari in Africa. I have talked with people who have. I don't know, but I'll just say this. If I ever do find myself in that experience, I will definitely be alert and of sober mind because you are putting yourself in the territory that other animals call home who literally have the capability and even the desire to rip your face off. And so that is not a time to just let down your guard and wander off into the woods, right? That is a time to be alert and of sober mind. And Peter's using this same imagery to describe the spiritual battle that every single one of us finds ourselves within. He goes on to say in verse 9, resist him, standing firm in the faith and your trust in Jesus, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. Right? He shares this as an encouragement to them to know that they are not alone in what they're facing, but uh, the sufferings that they are enduring is something that uh, are common and known to, to all across the scope of the world, that Christians everywhere face this spiritual affliction. And so... Really, the opening point is just to say that uh, to be alert and of sober mind because the battle is actually there. Whether we recognize it or not, it is real, and we've found ourselves in the midst of it. But I think from that point forward, there's a question that my guess is arises for at least a few, if not many of us. And it's the type of question that, um, that we often think, but maybe don't always voice. And I think the question would be this, right? That when we look at the biblical writings and you read them, you see demons and you see Jesus in kind of having these encounters with them and casting them out and bringing healing to people. And you're like, yeah, I don't, I'm not really sure how to make sense of that. Is this just, is this just them making the best uh, with what they knew at the time that they can? Is this just them kind of making sense of what they're experiencing, lacking the language, lacking the advancements of modern science and medicine? And now 2,000 years down, down the road, we have sort of a better, more in-depth understanding of what can go wrong within a person's life and mind and body. And so we, we can kind of just discard this information, this angle of looking at things, because this isn't really how it's at play. That's just how they described it then, right? Is that the case? And I think sometimes those are the questions that we can be afraid to voice sometimes. And yet when we do, it gives us the ability to allow that question to lead us to truth and, and even to consider, does the Bible have an answer to this question? Is it ignorant of this uh, sort of tension or does it speak to it directly? And one of the helpful things, thankfully, about this particular question is that it does speak to that tension, to that question directly. And the Bible is not ignorant of these distinctions. So one example of this actually comes in the Gospel of Luke, right? The Gospels being biographies of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And uh, Luke was written by um, one of the followers of Jesus in the first century. His name was Luke. He's a journalist, historian, uh, considered by historians today to be one of the most exact and accurate historians of the ancient world, uh, and specific in, in his accounts. And 
And one of the important things to note about him is that in addition to these other proficiencies, Luke was also a doctor, meaning that he had received medical training and provided medical care for people on a regular basis. This was what he did for a living. And I get that first century medicine likely differed pretty significantly from medicine today. And yet at the same time, what we see is that in his account, he makes use of this medical knowledge and training and draws a clear distinction between suffering that arises from the demonic at play within a person's life and suffering that arises from something else entirely. So we see this actually in his account, Luke chapter 8, verses 1 to 3. It says, after this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news, the gospel of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is going to play a significant role in our conversation later on, but for now, you can feel free to tuck that away. It says the 12 were with him, the 12 disciples. Peter, who we just mentioned, was one of them. And it says, and also some women who had been cured, notice this, of evil spirits and diseases, that it's drawing a distinction between them, saying that is there overlap at some point, perhaps, and yet there are times when a person's suffering has entirely to do with diseases, and there are times when it has entirely to do with evil spirits, and there are times when, uh, when suffering arises from causes that have nothing to do with the demonic, but there are times when it absolutely plays a role in the affliction that we are facing. It goes on to describe the women that Jesus provided healing for. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. Joanna, the wife of Chusa, the manager of Herod's household. Herod was the ruler over the people of Israel, serving the Roman Empire in the first century. And so his manager, Chusa, was married to this woman named uh, Joanna, and she's one of the women that Jesus brought healing to. Susanna and many others. These women, in response to Jesus healing them, were helping to support Jesus and the disciples financially out of their own means, right? They were supporting them financially so that Jesus could continue to spread the message of the kingdom of God so people could come to trust in and find joy in him. But the main point for our discussion today to kind of draw out of that passage is that even the biblical writings themselves draw a distinction between suffering that arises from the demonic and suffering that arises from something else entirely. And so when it comes to recognizing the demonic at play within our lives, the first thing is to recognize that not every unfortunate or challenging or difficult thing that happens in our lives has a demon underneath it. Like, for example, if you go to Starbucks and you find out that they're out of the syrup that you need for your favorite fall latte, that is a tragedy to be sure, but... That doesn't mean that there's spiritual warfare at play in that particular example. So I think what can be helpful is just to walk through uh, sort of different causes, different origins for suffering that we might experience within our lives. So, so these are four different causes of affliction. Um, first off, there's the physical. Uh, one of the things we see from our experience of life and even from the biblical writings as well is that our bodies are both beautiful and broken. Right? The, the Bible talks about how we are fearfully and wonderfully made. God has made everything beautiful in its time. That includes you and uh, me. That includes us and our bodies. Our bodies are beautiful, and yet at the same time, they are undeniably broken. And so much of the suffering that we experience in this life is due to the fact of the brokenness of our bodies. And that has nothing to do with the demonic at play within our lives. The second one would be this, psychological. Um, and in some ways, this could even be an extension of the physical, that one of the things we've learned with modern medicine is that there are things that can go wrong within the brain, that some of the brokenness of the body can uh, sort of um, uh, find its home within the brain, and things don't always function within the way that they were designed to. And that can have a significant impact on our experience of life, that the psychological can be a place where our suffering arises from. And that is real. Uh, number three, relational. I think so many of us have had the experience at different seasons within our lives of having relationships that were incredibly difficult uh, and even damaging and harmful. And, and even though we're you know, down the road from that in a different season of life, that relationship may look different and healthier now. Maybe that relationship isn't even present within our lives anymore, and yet the experience marks us. And that damage that we experience, the harm that we suffered is something that continues to have an effect on our lives and on our relationships today, even years and decades down the road. And it's an unfortunate reality that we don't need a demon to be equipped to injure each other in relationships. That is unfortunately something we're well able to do on our own, uh, as I'm sure every single one of us has an experience of being on the receiving end of that. But then fourth and finally, 
when it comes to causes and origins of suffering, we'd be remiss to not also acknowledge that the demonic has a role to play here because we do find ourselves within the midst of a spiritual battle. And so there are times when the suffering that we experience, whether it be a fear that's unnatural, whether it be thought patterns that we just can't get out of, whether it be tension that arises in relationships that just doesn't make any natural sense, right? That these things can, can have an aspect of the demonic at play within them. And so what I'd like to do in this conversation is really just delve further into that particular cause of suffering and affliction within our lives so that we can be better equipped to recognize it when it's happening within our lives or perhaps the life of someone around us. And so let's go ahead and press on into it. So uh, the demonic as a cause of suffering within our lives. Well, in order for that to be the case, that means there's a demon, an actual being at play in the process. And a demon is an immaterial, an evil immaterial being. So in the broadest scope, God created all things, right? Uh, Including angels, angelic beings who are primarily, who are entirely actually immaterial in nature. They do not have physical bodies in the same way that we do. And they were created for good purposes and for a joyous existence. And yet what we find is that certain of these beings chose to align themselves with evil and in opposition to God. And when they made this decision, fundamentally their natures were changed, were altered, were warped. Because evil is something that we know philosophically doesn't exist in and of itself. Evil uh, only exists really as a warping or even a perversing of something that is intended to be good. And so when they set themselves in opposition to God, their nature was bent and warped away from the good and towards the evil. And they became fallen angels or what the biblical writings call demons. And so these demons, because they're in opposition to God, because they have uh, positioned themselves in a way where their nature has been warped from the good, they uh, have as a motivation actually our ruin, your ruin and mine. And so this is the unseen spiritual battle that we find ourselves in the midst of. Now, the New Testament, if you delve into the language, right, originally it was written in Koine Greek, which was just the common language of the Roman Empire in the first century. And so as people are communicating, writing letters back and forth, uh, of course, this is the language that they wrote their documents within. And when you look into the, the Greek... Uh, underneath the accounts really for uh, where we see this within the New Testament, the word that you find translates most directly into English with the the word demonization. Uh, That to, to suffer in a way that is demonic in its nature is to suffer demonization, which is being tormented by an evil spiritual being. Now, as soon as we get into that, I think for a lot of us, there's sort of a Um, a picture that enters our minds that has its origins in uh, the film, the classic horror film, The Exorcist, right? Which to this day, I still remember being at my dad's house uh, in the living room with my brother. It's late, it's pitch black out. The room is absolutely dark. The only light is coming from the TV and we're watching this movie and he keeps laughing and I'm like, just don't leave me. Just (laughs) because it was absolutely terrifying for a 12 year old kid, Um, even for a grown adult, I'll say. But um, <laughs> but, but, I'll keep, but what that movie often does, I think, is gives us really a, a popular culture portrayal of what it looks like to suffer demonic affliction. And yet what's important to stress today is that the, the portrayal the movie presents to us is not in any way, shape, or form what the biblical writings actually present to us. And there are certain translations of the the New Testament that use the language of possession, but possession indicates some things, has some connotations that don't exactly line up as well as the term demonization does with uh, the elements of the stories that we see recorded within the New Testament. And so, for example, I think one way to get at this is if you are in a community group and you've got some curious people in the group, maybe you yourself are curious about these things, one question that likely came up last week or might even come up this week would just be, uh, can, can a Christian be possessed by a demon? Can a Christian be demonized? What does that look like? What does it look like for a demon to uh, sort of be at play within a Christian's life? And this is what we'd say. Christians cannot be possessed or owned by a demon but can be influenced by one. 
that possession in the terms of uh, what the, the popular supernatural horror films present to us, possession indicates ownership and even control. And that's not something that we ever see at play within the biblical writings. And yet we do see demonization in, in the sense of torment uh, or even harassing a particular person or influencing their lives in such a way that, that brings about all kinds of harm and pain and suffering. And so this happens in a variety of different ways and we'll get to those, but I wanna highlight one particular way in which this operates that actually has nothing to do with the horror films that were so, um, that were so uh, common to our minds, but instead has something else, is an entirely different strategy. So 1 Timothy 4.3, this is written by Paul, another significant leader in the early church. He's writing to Timothy, a young friend of his who's pastoring in the city of Ephesus in the first century, which was an incredibly spiritually curious city. Uh, that had all kinds of uh, practices within the occult in particular. And so Paul's writing to Timothy to help him navigate some of these things. And this is what he says. The, the Spirit clearly says that in later times. You might be like, well, what on earth does that mean? Well, when he references the Spirit, he's talking about the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, who, um, in connection with human authors, brought about the writings of the Old and New Testament. So specifically, he's referring to the Old Testament here. And he's saying that, you know, this book says here, but instead of putting it in that way, he's saying the Spirit says here that in later times, some will abandon the faith, will abandon their trust in Jesus and follow deceiving spirits in things taught by demons. And so, so often we think of the exorcist and the Blair Witch Project and all those other things, but what Paul is actually highlighting here and what we see so commonly throughout the New Testament writings is that one of the most common and consistent ways that demonic activity is actually at play within our communities, within our region, within our lives is by persuading people to believe and to make decisions on the basis of and to build their lives upon things that are not true. Because in building our lives on things that are false, on lies, ultimately we are setting ourselves up for utter ruin and destruction in terms of our relationships, in terms of our personal stability, in terms of our purpose, in terms of our relationship with God. In all of these ways, building our lives upon lies brings ruin and pain and suffering. And so there are many ways in which the demonic can be at play within our lives, but one of the most common and consistent ways is this right here. Biblical scholar and theologian Michael Heiser, he sort of summarizes these uh, by putting it like this. He says, the overarching point is that while Christians cannot be owned by Satan, an idea that derives from the unfortunate possession language, they can be demonized. And demonization can take various forms, persecution, harassment, being captivated by false teaching, and enslavement to sin. So the first of our two questions for today was to get to a place where we could understand and perhaps even recognize when the suffering that we're experiencing in our lives has the demonic at play within it. And, and hopefully at this point, that question has been answered. And now the second point of our coming together today is to delve into answering the question, when you determine that it actually is the demonic that's at play within your life, how do you address that? How do you respond? What does it look like to fight back in the midst of the unseen battle that surrounds us? And that's where I'd like to go next. And I want to start off with the passage, 2 Timothy 2, verses 25 and 26. This is Paul again writing to Timothy, who's still in Ephesus. And uh, this is what he, he's given him some instruction on how to respond to people who are spreading these lies uh, and helping persuade other people to build their lives on them. And Paul says to Timothy, this is how you should respond. He says, opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. And I think this is fascinating that the way he describes it is that uh, almost in building a life upon a lie, a person is in some sense blinded to the reality uh, as it truly is. And so to escape from that is to recognize the lie for what it is, to instead build your life on truth instead, to replace that. And this is described as a, almost a coming, like an awakening, coming to your senses and escaping, realizing that you've fallen prey to a particular trap and having the ability to step out of that. 
And even beyond that, some of the language we see that's fascinating here is that the being taken captive language. Thomas Brooks is a theologian um, from church history, and he has a book where he writes specifically about this topic, even this passage and that phrase, and he kind of expands and extrapolates on it. This is what he says. The apostle, referring to Paul, who wrote this letter to Timothy, says the apostle Paul alludes to one who is asleep or drunk who is to be awakened and restored to his senses. And that Greek word that is here rendered taken captive signifies to be taken alive. The word is properly a military word and signifies to be taken alive as soldiers are taken alive in the wars or as birds are taken alive and ensnared in the fowler's net. Satan has snares for the wise and snares for the simple, snares for hypocrites and snares for the upright, snares of the generous souls and snares for timorous souls, snares for the rich and snares for the poor, snares for the aged and snares for youth. But happy are those souls that are not taken and held in the snares that he has laid. In other words, the first step in responding to the demonic when it's at play within our lives is at first to recognize that the demonic is at play within our lives. And so that really is the first step. Just the being able to recognize it is the first thing and to know uh, that we have an enemy and we're in the midst of a battle. But beyond that, then the question is, okay, so I've recognized it, but what do I do now? Is there, is there a certain kind of formula? Do I have to say it just like this? Is, do I have to get this phrase attached at the beginning or at the end or at the first, kind of the perfect place in the middle? Do I have to ask certain questions, right? What does this look like? How, how do I make sure that I do this right? And what I would say is that uh, what we find when we look through the New Testament accounts and we see Jesus encountering spiritual evil is that in so many of these different accounts, the details actually differ. It's not as if he's a magician making use of the same phrase and formula again and again and again. The details differ, which shows us that the one thing that is unified throughout, what is central, is not a formula, but is instead this king who is bringing the arrival of his kingdom, the one who is the highest authority in all of reality, that this is what is central above and beyond all else, that there is a clash and a conflict of kingdoms at play here. And just to give you an example, we see this in uh, Mark chapter 1, verses 21 to 28. So we see it here, verse 21. It says, they, meaning Jesus and his disciples, went to Capernaum. In the northern part of Israel, around the Sea of Galilee, Capernaum was a city located there. And, and it says, and when the Sabbath came, which is Saturday, the day of rest for the people of Israel, even to this day, it says, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. So the synagogue is sort of a, a similar gathering place like this, but for Jewish people where they would gather and still do today on Saturdays and read from the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament. And it says that Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. And so there's a contrast here, right? The contrast is that the teachers of the law, general teachers of the day, when they would come into the synagogue on Saturday, they would read from a passage from the Old Testament and teach upon it, offering their perspective on what it meant. But they didn't have the ability, they didn't have the authority to just simply offer their, trans, uh, their understanding of it, their interpretation but they always had to anchor their interpretation in the belief of some scholar or rabbi who came before them. So they could only teach in the authority of other people who came before. They didn't have the authority to offer interpretations themselves, and yet Jesus shows up on the scene and he does just that. And they're amazed because they understand the claim that he's making, that he understands what the Old Testament is teaching better than anyone else who has come before. And he doesn't need their authority to tell and to teach what it really and truly means. So in teaching in this way, he is making a significant claim of authority. And the people are like, man, I've never seen anything like this. What right does he have to offer and to teach in this particular way, in this is where the story continues. Verse 23, it says, Just then, a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, What is this? A new teaching and with authority. He even gives orders to impure spirits, and they obey him. And news about him spread quickly over the whole region 
of Galilee. So what we see is that he teaches in a way that makes a claim about his own authority. The people are asking, what right does he have to teach in this particular way? And then this encounter arises and he heals the man of the demonic affliction that he was suffering. And surely part of the motivation for doing so was mercy and compassion for this particular individual. But even beyond that, what we see is that this is a demonstration of the authority that Jesus has. And so he makes the claim of authority with his teaching. And then he demonstrates his authority in this particular encounter. And news about him spreads not just through the synagogue, but through the entire surrounding region as people come to understand and to see that this is no ordinary teacher or rabbi, but that he is the highest authority in all of reality, able even to combat and command the spiritual forces of evil. And so what we see from this encounter, from this account, is that it's not just about pushing back the kingdom of darkness or the kingdom of Satan, but even more so, it's not about just leaving this neutral territory in between, but it's about pushing back the kingdom of darkness so that the kingdom of God can expand in a region, in a place, in a community, and in the lives of real individuals just like you and me. Again, Michael Heiser, a biblical scholar and theologian, he summarizes it like this, saying, the spiritual warfare needs to be understood in the context of the conflict between two kingdoms, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. During Jesus' public ministry, we see this binary opposition. It is no coincidence that the expulsion of demons from people and places accompanied the inauguration of the kingdom of God. Because as the kingdom of God grows, the kingdom of darkness shrinks and loses ground. And this is significant here. Jesus never commanded that his followers confront spiritual entities. Instead, he gave the Great Commission, That's something we see at the very close of the book of Matthew, uh, where Jesus gives the instructions to the church to essentially continue to spread the message about him, inviting people into a trusting relationship with him and one that grows over the course of their lifetime. That the primary strategy for spiritual warfare is this. He goes on to say a spiritual entity might be driven away, but that doesn't necessarily result in a new soul entering the kingdom of God. This latter goal is the reason Jesus gave his life and rose from the dead. The work of Christ was not about power encounters with demons. It was much more comprehensive and enduring than that. The goal was to bring Eden full circle, right? Eden is something we read about in the very opening pages of the Bible before brokenness entered the relationship between God and humanity, before brokenness entered our relationships with each other that the goal of the kingdom of God is to bring about the restoration of that and even the advancement of it in some ways. And so the goal was to have a human family with him forever. Punishing fallen spirits does not accomplish God's original Edenic goal. Only the Great Commission accomplishes the ends to which God has been working as well as the defeat and punishment of rebellious evil spirits. The Great Commission is thus a comprehensive plan for spiritual warfare. And if you're asking the question, what does this look like here? What does it look like to engage in the unseen battle at SMCC? How do we do this? This is the primary answer, that it's not about going out looking for uh, different spiritual things. It's not like a church version of paranormal activity where we're seeking out places and people who are afflicted by demons so we can have these dramatic power encounters. That's not the strategy. That's not the aim. Instead, it's just simply again and again and again to present the truth of who Jesus is and what he has done on our behalf in his life, in his death on the cross, and in his resurrection, to present it as clearly and as understandably as we can so that people can have the opportunity to consider those claims in the context of community, to develop relationships, to ask their questions, to explore, and eventually to place their trust in Jesus and to continue to grow in that trust in him one step at a time over the course of their lives. Because fundamentally, that is the primary way that the kingdom of darkness is pushed back from a person's life and the kingdom of God is expanded within it and even through it. And so that is the primary way that we participate within this battle here at SMCC. And yet at the same time, we would be remiss to not at least acknowledge that there are some rare and bizarre episodes that do occur from time to time. And, and should you find yourself in a type of encounter where uh, you're face to face with the reality that the demonic is at play within a person's life, the question is how do you respond to that? And, 
And what I want to do is just walk through really um, our strategy that is as simple and as straightforward as we can make it for walking through that. And it's just the six A's for addressing demonic affliction. If you want, you can write this down and keep it in your Bible. <laughs> but um, the six A's for addressing demonic affliction. That was partly a joke, but it might be helpful to do that. So uh, number one, attune to the pain. So again, this is a person who is suffering and they're experiencing difficulty within their lives. There's affliction. And so the first thing is there may be a whole host of emotions that they're experiencing as a result of this. There could be fear. There could be uh, sadness. There could be anger. And the first step is just to hear the person's story and to be emotionally present with them, to attune to the emotions that they felt throughout this experience. That's the first step. Second step, assess the affliction. Again, not every difficulty that we experience in this life is demonic in its nature. And so the, first, the second step is really just to examine and assess the situation and consider, is there some other cause for this that really has nothing to do with the demonic at all? And that may be the case, but if what you find in your assessment is that the demonic is clearly at play within the situation, then proceed to the next steps, right? Which step three is asking about allegiance. One of the things the Bible teaches is that God is able to and does actually work through all of the, the difficulties, the challenges that we go through in our lives, that, that God is actually able to work through and redeem those in a way that brings about good for us. And I think even something like this actually presents an opportunity for a person to grow in their relationship and their trust in Jesus. And so step three is to ask about allegiance. Is, is Jesus the, the highest authority within your life? Is he Lord? Is he the one that you have submitted to? Is he the person that you have given your life to, or is he not? Because the truth is, in the midst of the unseen battle, the only victory that you and I can have is the victory we share with Jesus, that he has won on our behalf. And apart from him being Lord of our life, there's no real victory to find apart from him. And so this is an opportunity to have a conversation around that. Step four, appeal to the truth and power of Jesus. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, right? That he himself is the one who defines reality and good and evil and truth itself is rooted and grounded in him. But at the same time, while the demonic are, uh, in, are finite beings, Jesus is infinite in power, in wisdom, in knowledge, in presence. Jesus is God, the highest authority in all of reality. And so we appeal to both the truth and the power of Jesus, Step five, we ask Jesus to powerfully remove evil from this place, from this person, from this situation, from this relationship. Whatever the context is, we ask Jesus to remove evil from this situation. And then the sixth and final step is to act on a spiritual next step in confidence. Now, I get that in some ways, that final step almost seems like it's tacked on and it doesn't really seem to fit. It's almost like, man, after the person's been delivered from this, after the situation's been delivered from this, then why is there another step, right? Why, why throw that on there? And I think the truth is because acting on a spiritual next step in some ways leads us further into a trusting relationship with Jesus. And this is significant because deliverance without discipleship is dangerous, Deliverance without discipleship, without a growing relationship with Jesus is dangerous because fundamentally what it does, while it may deliver the person from the demonic affliction that they've been suffering, if, that, uh, if they've been delivered from that but haven't been filled with Jesus in a sense, if their life, if, if the, the empty space hasn't been filled with devotion to Jesus, hasn't been filled with the Spirit of God, then fundamentally that person, is, the person actually has been left in a position to find themselves even worse off than they were to begin with. And I know that that might sound odd, but it's something that Jesus himself actually speaks to. Right, Matthew chapter 12, he says this, when an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house I left. When it arrives, it finds the house or the person unoccupied, swept clean and put in order. Then it goes and takes with it seven other spirits, more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there. And the final condition of that person is worse than the first. That is how it will be with this wicked generation. What Jesus is saying is that to bring deliverance to someone who is not a follower of Jesus actually just creates a vacuum within that person. 
And if that vacuum isn't filled with the Spirit of God, if that vacuum isn't filled out of a decision to trust Jesus, if that vacuum isn't filled out of a relationship with Jesus and, uh, and giving your life to him and allowing him to be Lord of your life, highest authority, then, um, then actually that person has been left in a worse position than they were to begin with. And the suffering that they faced before is something that will likely only get worse. But the good news is that with Jesus, we can know victory and we can know healing. Whether the affliction is demonic in nature um, or any other uh, cause of the affliction as well. Right, again, going back to the earlier part, we, see, we saw that affliction could stem from any number of origins, any number of causes within our lives. And yet, one of the things the biblical writings teach us is that Jesus has accomplished victory through his death on the cross, through his resurrection uh, over the grave. That through these things, not only has he accomplished victory over the powers of darkness, but he has over sickness and death as well. And one day, he will do away with these things entirely. And the affliction and the suffering that we have known in this life, demonic or not, will one day be gone as he sets all things right and makes all things new. And so, since the battle is won, we invite people into a victorious kingdom through evangelism, sharing the message of Jesus, uh, through discipleship, inviting and even challenging people to continue to grow in a trusting relationship with Jesus, and if necessary, through deliverance. But the bottom line is, be awake, be alert, and be confident. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we thank you for the time together this morning. We thank you for the chance to delve into a subject which is uh, not one that we talk about or discuss a whole lot, and yet truly is one that is so helpful um, for our lives. And so I just pray for those who maybe are experiencing a bit of suffering in their lives, whether it's demonic in origin or not. I pray that you would continue to be close to us, that you would draw near to us and, and continue to form within each and every one of us the conviction, the ability to trust that victory is found in you and that you are the highest authority in all of reality, that even the demons submit to you and tremble at the mention of your name and that in you we can know the peace and the joy that you offer us. And so I pray that more and more as we grow in our relationships with you, we would walk in and know in and enjoy the life that you offer to us. All this we ask and pray in your name. Would you stand and sing with us, please?
tonight 